Hey you and welcome. My name is Mike and in this old podcast I have the story, the legend if you will, of the Batavia. We are setting sail. We are setting sail to a time. A time being the 1600s and wow we are just diving straight in. We're, we're raw dogging this one folks. We're going to talk about a ship. A ship owned by the Dutch East India Company. This ship, it was carrying gold and jewels, and it was valued in in the millions upon upon millions of today's money. And I suppose millions upon millions back in their day's money too. It was going from Amsterdam, uh, the Netherlands, to Indonesia. And during that voyage, and it was a long ass voyage, things went... How can I put this delicately? Things went wrong. Very... Very, very wrong for everyone on board. I mean, honestly, here, listen, me me personally, not a fan of sailing, lads, yeah, says the guy who's from a small island. But yeah, you know, honestly, it's not, not for me. I get seasick to shit on, like, modern day boats, which, you know, have stabilizers and yada, 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 yada. So you can imagine what this journey would have been like on one of those old-timey sailing boats 400 years ago. And that's before I even get into, you know, how horrific the conditions on on the boat were. This was not a five-star affair, my friends. And during this voyage, one member of the crew, a high-ranking member, was secretly a heretic. He was a vicious, manipulative, bloodthirsty man, and he thought to himself, there's a lot of uh, gold on this ship. I, I think I could probably find some uses for that myself. Near the end of the voyage, there was a plot and a mutiny, but it didn't it didn't go quite to plan. And the mutineers and the loyal crew certainly were not banking on the ship striking rocks off the coast of Western Australia. The ship it would land on a series of, of small rocks. Des- like Desert Island doesn't do it justice. There's barely even sand. Just rocks. And so the mutineers and the loyal remaining crew were stranded on these tiny series of small islands under the hot Australian sun. And what followed was a bloodbath of murders, executions, sexual violence and battles between the two groups. Until a rescue ship arrived. However, what the rescuers didn't know was that the mutineers were planning on hijacking the rescue ship to go off and live a life of piracy. This ship was the Batavia, and it was sailing to... uh, Batavia, so this definitely won't get confusing at all, folks. Batavia, by the way, that's modern-day Jakarta, Indonesia. The ship, it was full of gold and jewels to work with the kings who ruled in that part of the world, especially the Mughal emperor, who was an emperor who ruled much of, much of India, and so they were going to use all this money to bribe and buy the spices that they needed back in Europe. See, what, what drove the companies to, uh, these companies to colonize, genocide, enslave, and commit the, basically the horrific atrocities of the day, was what they had in South East Asia, and what they didn't have, uh, back in Europe. Spices. That's what this was, that's what this was all about. Yum yum spice in my tom tom. Yeah, uh, European food kind of sucks. All right. And that's, that's what all this was about. Bringing money to pay off the kings and establish colonies for that sweet old spice. You guys got your chilies. You got your peppers. We have, um, potatoes. Actually, you know, back in the early 1600s, potatoes were like a recent thing from the Americas. So, like, (laughs) in Europe, they didn't even have the boring food. Really were fucked. But spice was what led to big bastard companies like the Dutch East India Company coming to, to power. And sending ships, just like the Batavia, for trade. Now, just to, just to tell you, like, a little bit of background about, about this whole story. The Dutch East India Company... Um, I guess you you would say it's like the it was like the Amazon of its day. Like imagine Amazon, but bigger and way more powerful. You know, like it's actually quite like Amazon. It was big, it was powerful. They kind of owned everything, and they treated their employees like shit. If you did, if you know the the Pirates of the Caribbean movies, well, you know the bad guys in those movies were the English East India Company, who were like a rival of the Dutch East India Company. 
Think of the biggest companies in the world today. Multiply them by 10. These companies, they had their own countries, their own private armies, their own laws, and they could wage war as they pleased. You know, it's like when we see these dystopian futures, you know, Blade Runner, Cyberpunk, and all these, you know, you see in the future these global corporations rule the world. They were already here. Like the Dutch East India Company, it's gone down in history as the most valuable company of all time. Like, you could combine today, you could combine Apple, Alphabet, Microsoft, Amazon, Facebook, and a whole lot of others, they would still only be equal to how much the Dutch East India Company was worth in the early 1600s. By the way, first company in history you could also buy stock in, so, you know, if you'd gotten in there early, you'd be doing all right now, 400 uh, years later. And this company would employ one person who would cause the Batavia to run aground, leading to one of the bloodiest and, and probably the craziest mutiny and stranded on a desert island story you'll ever hear. By the way, guys, I just want to give a quick shout out to the main source for this, and that is Batavia's Graveyard, the true story of the mad heretic who led one of history's bloodiest mutinies by Mike Dash. Super great read. Uh, once I, I read it, I realized I had to tell y'all this story. By the way, mad heretic? That sounds cool as shit. And also, if you could uh, do me a favor, if you could rate and review the podcast, that helps out so, so much. If you do, I promise I will follow in the footsteps of this mad heretic and lead a bloody mutiny. But I'll never say where, so look forward to that. Now, let's give it a go. Let me begin this story with where it all went horribly wrong. And that was on the early morning hours of June 4th, 1629. Now this was in the Southern Hemisphere, so, so June was winter. But, I mean, kind of also around this particular part of the world, there's kind of no such thing really uh, as winter. And there, the Batavia was gliding through the waves of the Southern Indian Ocean. It was pushing north the wind helping, and it surged swell after swell. This was the maiden voyage of the Batavia, her first time out at sea, having sailed from the port of Amsterdam back in October of 1628, having been at sea for seven months by this stage. It's, it's a long time, but by this stage it was nearing the end of its arduous trip. Yeah, um, as I said at the top, sailing back then, it was a load of shit. It's it sucked balls. But I'll I'll get I'll get in more into that into that later. This was at a time when when some folk on these ships doing these kind of like long ass journeys, some people would literally go insane from how bad the conditions were. They were madhouses on the sea. This one especially for the approximately 320 people on board. It had done over 13,000 miles by this stage, with about another 2,000 to go over the endless blue before it reached its destination. And back at this time, back in the day, not many ships from Europe made it, just could survive, could last that long, could make this, this kind of journey. This was, this was still in the age of discovery. Like uh, Australia, that was still pretty much uncharted territory. All, all people knew, and all like it was on maps, was there's a big piece of land there. We have no idea what it is. We just know that there's land. End of story. No Europeans had settled in Australia yet. They wouldn't for like another hundred years. Uh, Jamestown in, in Virginia, the first permanent settlement in North America, that had just been settled. It, it was still a tiny colony of like a couple of thousand people where you would have a 50% chance of surviving the year. Now, your chances on the Batavia were not much better. In fact, you'll see much worse. But at this point, the fresh food all gone, the fresh water filled with worms and wriggly things. <laughs> have a sup of that! The, the ship stank of piss, poop, sweat, 
and there's literally nothing to do. Nothing to do except look at the varying shades of blue. You got, you got your water, you got your sky, you got your end of list. So, the Batavia was in largely uncharted waters, but it was nearing the end of this long journey, and it was a strong ship. It was brand new shampoo when it left port. But by now, it, it was pretty weathered, uh, the seawater making, <laughs> making shite of the ship. It, it had been painted green, red, and gold. Now it was worn down to brown. Barnacles, they covered, they covered the bottom, and it was swollen uh, with water making the trip from Amsterdam sailing along the coast of Africa, turning towards Brazil to pick up the currents, and then swinging back around towards Africa, around South Africa and towards the Southern Ocean. The skipper, the captain of the Batavia, was a man named, and uh, by the way, you'll have to excuse me folks, there's a lot of Dutch names in this story, so if I pronounce wrong, uh, please forgive, I beg, I beg. The captain of the Batavia was a guy named Arian Jacobs. He, now Arian, he's a character, he's like a weathered old yeah! seaman. He had sailed the seven seas and he had been with, with the company, the, the Dutch East India Company, for over 20 years. Done many a voyage transporting gold, uh, jewels, soldiers, you name it. Fighting pirates, both, um, both within and without for many years. He was also, I mean, I guess kind of as you can guess from a sailor, he was kind of a walking stereotype, uh, Captain Arian. I, I, I think uh, Quint from Jaws. A drinker with a quick temper, and also a bit of a creep around the ladies. Of which, you know, being a sailor, there would have been sweet fuck all of. There was, there was a number of women on the Batavia, though. Mostly wives going to join their husbands who were already in the colonies or were sailing with them to, to start a new life or were like their handmaidens, servants, that kind of, that kind of thing. But Captain Arian, he, he was not the actual head honcho on this voyage. See, as I said, the Batavia, it was not a government navy or whatever. It was run by a private company. So, so the actual person in charge during this voyage was a guy named Francisco Pelsart. He was, was, his position was, um, it was called an upper merchant. And so within the company, he was higher up than Captain Arian would have been. <laughs> yeah, if, uh, even companies 400 years ago had their bureaucratic bullshit. Lady, ladies and gentlemen, like Francisco, he was the, he was the commander of, of the voyage. He had no sailing knowledge, though. He, he was just like a company man. He was essentially a manager of sorts. He was just the highest ranking member in the company, but he would go on to do dealings with the various people in the East Indies. He was like responsible for doing trade deals, that sort of thing. But as I said, on the voyage, he was the biggest dog on board, but he, but he left a sailing to, to Captain Arian. And Captain Arian and upper merchant uh, Francisco did not get on too well at all. Uh, they had their own history together. Um, Filled with like some some kind of petty bullshit. They had no no chemistry, no no water cooler talk between the two of them. You know what I mean? Well, I suppose wormy water talk, I guess, would be more apt. They had met a couple of years before, and over drinks one night, they they, they didn't bond. Let's let's put it that way. So the Batavia it was gliding through the waters of the Southern Ocean. And it was, a, it was at around 3 a.m., early morning hours, when it's said to be the quietest part of the day and, and everybody's kind of half asleep, that one sailor at the front of the ship saw white water dead ahead. Now, he said this to Captain Arian, but Arian said, Bullshit. There, there's, a, on my charts, there's no rocks in this, in this area. It's just the moon lighting up the pitch black waters. You know, don't be talking shite. It was not the moon lighting up the pitch black water, and the Batavia hit rocks in the middle of the ocean at full speed. The ship was smashed onto the rocks, the timbers buckling and ripping apart, the sails pushing the ship onto the rocks with the wind at their backs. The crew knew immediately what to do. They started, they started chucking every single thing they could off the ship to lighten the load and hopefully unstick itself. But the ship had been ripped apart at the front 
And as panic set in, the crew knowing what to do, the passengers had no clue. And then, lowering the Batavia's anchor, they found the water was no more than 12 feet deep. Which meant, long story short, they were well and truly fucked as the tides could make that 12 feet even shallower. They even made the dramatic decision to cut down the main sail as it was the huge sail pinning them to the reef. But it did nothing. They were well and truly shipwrecked. But where? Well, they didn't know it at the time, but they were shipwrecked on the Abrolhos Islands, about 50 miles off the coast of Western Australia. Now, a very small group of islands and coral reefs. Um, how really just rocks, sun bleached rocks. No trees, no real grass other than what survived under the hot southern sun, no rivers, running water or anything. Like each of these islands was absolutely tiny, just a tiny speck. Just desert rocks in the ocean, no shade, no cover from the wind, which would ravage uh, these islands. They crashed onto the coral. And so a few groups set out on small boats for, the, for these islands. And people were panicking to get off to Batavia at this point. The men, women, and children as the hull began to flood with water. Some drowned trying to escape the ship. By the evening, the day the boat crashed on those rocks, about 180 people had made landfall on one of the islands, later known as Batavia's graveyard, as it, as it was the closest to the ship. With them, about 150 pints of shitty quality drinking water and 12 barrels of bread. Some, some jewelry had been taken too. This was at the insistence of Francisco Pelsart, the manager of the voyage. He wanted to, you know, the most valuable stuff saved. I mean, it was, it, it was his head on the line, and the Dutch East India Company were harsh masters at the best of times. 120 people were still on the ship, and a good number of them sailors. No sailors. The, these ones, anyway, and, and back in the day, they knew what happened to shipwrecks. Nothing good. And so they, well... Well, we're going down, folks, so smoke them if you got them. Many just decided to break into the officers' sashes of booze and get shit-faced. They began raiding the stores of gold and, and jewels. They, they had the, you know, we're all gonna die, so who gives a shit mentality. Over the next day or so, more, more people were rescued from the Batavia and, and began being split amongst the, amongst the islands. The food and water... However, that was running out quick. And so, Captain Arian and Francisco Pelsart, they, they debated what to do. They were, they were the two in charge of this entire thing. And looking at their charts and at their maps, they realized where they were. The, uh, this, this particular archipelago had been mapped out about 10 years previously, so... Okay, we know where we are, and we have some small boats still surviving. They were saying... Essentially, the men are, are out of our control at this point. They're drinking, there's gold, and the rule book is in the shredder. Arian said to Francisco, Don't expect the men to obey you anymore. If you can save yourself, do so. Four days after the Batavia hit the rocks, Captain Arian, Francisco Pelsart, and about 40 others left. They got into a boat they had that could fit about 40 people, and they set sail for Batavia, the city. The, the idea was, don't worry lads, we'll, we'll be right back with some rescuers. We'll see, in a, we'll see in a few. They left behind about 200 people on the island, Batavia's graveyard, and about, about 70 who were still inside the wreck, while about 40 of them, including Francisco Pelsart and Captain Arian Jacobs, left to try and save themselves. One person who was left behind was Francisco's assistant, the, the under-merchant to Francisco's upper-merchant. His name was Geronimus Cornelius, and he was the mad heretic, who from then on would begin butchering, murdering, and raping the others, and begin battle with a small group of company loyalists 
across the islands. Geronimus, he wasn't always this way though. Geronimus was 30 years old, a native of the United Provinces, what the Netherlands was before it became the country of the Netherlands. He had a great education, he came from a high social class, higher even than his boss, Francisco Pelsert. But he was also a desperate guy, a guy who needed an escape. I mean, to be honest, that's the only sort of people who would set sail with the Dutch East India Company. Like, rare, rarely did people do it by choice. It, it was more for people who were running from something. I mean, I mean first of all, uh, doing these voyages for the Dutch East India Company, who were a shitty company to work for and paid pennies. First of all, these voyages were long and dangerous, and the life expectancy of someone who arrived in the East Indies? Three years. Whoa, boy. There are no Ten Commandments south of the equator, they would say. And here's a quote from, from this time. The company is a great refuge for all spoilt brats, bankrupts, cashiers, brokers, tenants, bailiffs, informers, and such like rakes. Its soldiers and sailors are violent, feckless, and otherwise unemployable, and its merchants, either disgraced debtors or plucked students, who would risk anything for a chance to restore failing fortunes. Geronimus, now our mad heretic, a little bit of everything listed. He had been, at one point, an apprentice apothecary, as essentially something kind of like a medieval, early modern period pharmacist. You know, he would, uh, he would make potions, solutions, creams, using herbs and bones. At, time, at times, you know, apothecaries, they'd even raid Egyptian tombs for, for mummies that they would grind, they would grind down to dust. This is mad shit, all that sort of thing. And they would use these creations to cure everything from, like, headaches to, well, every sort of ailment. Were they all placebos, do you think? Uh, they, I mean, they probably got it right sometimes, right? Like, this plant contains a chemical which blah blah blah. Kind of like a witch, though. And also, kind of like a witch, shady apothecaries would make poisons, too, for the right price. So, Geronimus, he became uh, an apothecary. He set up shop in Harlem, which is a city just outside of Amsterdam, which, by the way, you probably guessed, uh, Harlem, New York, is named after the city in Amsterdam. And he was good. He was, he was very successful at his business. He, he was in a wealthy town, his shop was in a good location, and he was good at his job. And he was, he was gregarious, he got on well with, with everybody, he was a charmer. However, things uh, would go ba uh, from bad to worse for our buckaroo. His wife gave birth to a son, and, and it was a very tough birth, and, and she later fell seriously ill, like they thought, they thought she would die. It turned out that the midwife they had during the birth, she was like this crazy deranged old bitch, and she had left part of the placenta inside, and it became infected, hence why Geronimus' wife became like deathly ill. And so his wife was at death's door. And Geronimus, what he did, he, he went to look for a nurse to take care of, to take care of his baby, because, I mean, his wife couldn't, couldn't feed the baby, and they, you know, they needed somebody for, um, you know, uh, titty milk. They hired, he hired, I guess, a woman named Helgen, who was a <laughs> fucking insane lowlife, I guess, is the best way of putting it. Low morals, they, they would have said back in the day. A few months after hiring this woman, Helgen, his baby son was dead. The baby had died of syphilis. As you can probably guess, it's unlikely that their, the baby son got it from Geronimus and his wife. But, hey, word began to spread around town. And well, no, no, no one wanted to buy potions and ointments from someone who may have a transmittable disease. And then it's got the whole sexual association, so people were like, his business it started going downhill pretty, pretty quickly. And there was also a war going on at the time between the United Provinces and Spain, which... You, you know, the economy, and, and so on and so forth. Geronimus Cornelius, he had debts, 
Uh, and it was like the business, it looked like it would have been a great success. It was now on its ass. The war had tightened belts. His re reputation was swiftly going downhill due to rumors. And he soon became bankrupt. Now, to, to learn a little bit about Geronimus, he had some strange beliefs. I guess they were even stranger back in the day. He was brought up Anabaptist, which is an offshoot of Protestantism, right? Today it would be like Amish people, Mennonites, that, that sort of thing, right? Very peaceful people, right? Back then, Anabaptists during this period, not quite so. He was from an extreme set of this religion who were militant fanatics who believed that the second coming of Jesus Christ Get your boots on, like he's just down the road. They would form armies. They would go around laying sieges, laying sieges to towns in uh, the United Provinces, North North Germany. You know, killing people who lived there, killing like thousands died during this time. This led to a siege in, in one part of of Germany that this these Anabaptists they were super strong in, and they had declared their own country. Essentially, everybody else was fed up with them. And back in the day, revolutionaries, no one was too keen on that at all. Especially not this kind of revolutionaries who practiced polygamy and communal property. Even back then, communism was a no-no. This was in the Anabaptist city of Munster, which the Anabaptists had declared as a new Jerusalem. And so they were besieged. The walls of the town were destroyed by cannon fire. All the male members of this religion were either hung or beheaded, and all the female members were taken to the river and drowned. Did not mess around too much uh, back in those days, huh? Uh, the religion had never really recovered, and as I said, it's offshoots that have descended from, from it. They're very peaceful people today. But our boy, Geronimus, Jerry, he was definitely, you know, brought up in the very militant sort, you know, God wills it, he shouts as he cuts off your head, that kind of thing. So probably like a good, uh, I don't know, I mean, his religion at the time were kind of like militant religious communists. So that would kind of make Geronimus like a Stalin type. Manipulative, bloodthirsty, power hungry. And he had made friends with, with philosophers and the like, one of whom was a guy named Johannes van der Beek, also called Terentius. Now, Johannes van der Beek, he, he's actually a very famous painter. Some of you listening to this, you may have heard of him. If you like your art history, he was one of those Dutch master type painters. And Geronimus and Johannes, they became friends. And they would talk about philosophy, share beliefs. Now, Johannes, he was a, a libertine, a hedonist. Didn't, he didn't really give a shit. And he would drink and bang, say whatever he wanted, do whatever he wanted. He would often cheers his drinks to the Prince of Darkness, making fun of like the, the crucifixion. He said he knew witchcraft, all, all that kind of thing. That was not a good idea to be doing that sort of thing around this time. Um, in Germany, around this time in the early 1600s, about a thousand people were executed after being accused of being witches. This is literally the time of burning people at the stakes. I mean, the Salem witchcraft trials, they haven't even happened yet. So Johannes van der Beek, he's probably kind of just, you know, fucking around. This was not a good time to be fucking around with that kind of stuff. But, you know, he was an artiste. That would land him, um, decades in dungeons. And this kind of, this would rub off. On, on Geronimus, you can do whatever you want. There are no laws, no gods, no beliefs, no nothing. Kill if you gotta kill, steal if you gotta steal, get power. Geronimus, he became a heretic with the goal of creating his own kingdom where he was God. Now, Johannes van der Beek. He would later be exiled for his heretical beliefs, and many who were associated with Johannes van der Beek were also arrested. Geronimus was very much associated with Johannes van der Beek, and so he constantly feared being thrown in the dungeons himself for sharing the same beliefs. Geronimus began to think 
he should leave the country. And so, in 1628, having grown up in a very crazy religion, bankrupt, having lost his son, and having made friends with so-called devil worshippers, he ended up in the city of Amsterdam, where the Dutch East India Company was based. By the way, having long abandoned his wife at this point. When signing up with the company, as it was called, it was often just called the company, they were so ubiquitous. You would sign a five-year contract. And the main rules for becoming an employee of the Dutch East India Company were, they were there was really three rules. You not be bankrupt, infamous, or Catholic. You couldn't be any of these, but they were usually ignored as Geronimus, he was bankrupt. How he got a job there, by the way, like especially up the ladder so soon, not entirely known. Probably through one connection he had made, or another. And this was at the time the Batavia was being constructed. Now, the company had a system for creating ships, almost like mass producing them. They would make about a hundred ships a year. That's a lot of ships a year. The Batavia though, it was more than that. It was the pride of the company. It was bigger, better constructed than the regular ones. 160 feet nuts to naval and it would take on 322 people, over half of which were sailors. The rest, soldiers for the private company army to bolster the defenses in the colonies, and passengers, among which were a number of women, approximately 22 women on the ship. One notable woman on board was named Lucretia Jans Doctor, notable because she was, she was a high-born, and she was especially beautiful. She was a super hottie. She was on board to join her husband, who was already in Batavia. She was 27 years old, and she had had three children, all of whom, however, died as, as infants. And she was an orphan. So she had no reason to, to stay in Europe. She was off to, off to join her husband. And among them were the materials for garrisons in the East Indies, gold, jewels to bribe local kings for their spices, and so on. I cannot understate how bad the food was in Europe at the time, and how needed spices were to mask the taste of, of rotting sour meat. And so, the Batavia would set sail on the 29th of October, 1628, commanded by Francisco Pelsart, subordinate Geronimus Cornelius, and captained by Arian Jacobs. They were part of a convoy of, of ships, you know, they would travel as a convoy to deter piracy. And so began seven long months uh, of horrific conditions. And, and this is before we even get to the mutiny, the shipwreck, and the bloodbath. For sailors aboard Indiamen, and that's what these types, types of ships were called, those that went this way, and this is a quote, Cursing, swearing, whoring, debauchery, and murder were mere trifles. There is always something brewing among these fellows, and if the officers did not crack down on them so quickly with punishments, their own lives would certainly not be safe for a moment among that unruly rabble. A sailor must be ruled with a rod of iron, like an untamed beast, otherwise he is capable of wantonly beating up anybody. Rough as a bear's arse, these lads. As I said, only those looking for an escape would sign up to be sailors, you know, people on the run, criminals. The pay was shit, the life short. The sail, the voyage, it was uh, uh, hard uh, from the start. Pretty early into it, they were, they were hit by storms as they rounded the coast of France and Spain, which would lurch the ship around. I mean, the, the ship would have been bobbing up and down constantly anyway. No, no stabilizers or anything. So it, it would have been very upsetting for even the strongest stomachs. Apparently, Geronimus, he was he was not great with the old sea, seasickness. Um, neither were the live pigs they had uh, for fresh meat. They would have pigs in the hold who would also uh, puke from seasickness, which is... Yikes. Yeah, things were gross. Bathing? Nope. No fresh water could be spared to wash clothing either. Uh, there were four toilets on the ship. Four toilets for 322 people. And I mean, I mean the toilets were just holes on the, th on the side of the ship. 
Uh, so, okay, people would pee everywhere, off the side of the ship, or, well, really just kind of anywhere. But, but poop in the toilet, right? The, the latrine. Well, riddle me this. How would you wipe? They, they figured it out. They figured it out. In the, in the latrine, in the, in the toilet, which was a hole. There was a long, shit-covered rope that dangled through the hole and into the, into the water below. And to wipe your ass, you would pull the rope up and rub a salty, wet rope uh, on your ass. Who needs bidets, huh? In the hold, no ventilation. So it would be unbearable down there uh, at times. And, and in fact, it was reported sometimes sailors would suffocate from a lack of air in the hold, like especially in the hotter climates. Everything was damp all the time and there was nothing to do. When the weather was good, the sailors, they got bored too. Everybody was just bored a lot of the time. Food was served three times a day, 8 a.m., 12 p.m., 6 p.m. The officers, they obviously had okay food, uh, the freshest of the food, you know, chicken, pigs. The regulars, bone dry biscuits and salted and brined meat. Yummy! Essentially quadruple salted meat. So, yeah. And the quality of food for everybody would get worse the longer the trip went as the fresh meat ran out and the shittier stuff was, was used. They didn't eat the uh, rats and insects the ship was full of, though, so they mustn't have been that hungry, right? Uh, yet. Like, the ship was hard. It was full of cockroaches and bed bugs everywhere. Huge bloated sea rats would scuttle around the place, like working their way into the caskets of food. Depression on these ships was a common illness. Sometimes people would go insane, refuse to eat, or even throw themselves overboard, wanting to end it all. Just realizing the magnitude of how long this would be and how bad the conditions were. And after that, it gets even better! When they would enter the South Atlantic, they entered what they called the Scurvy Belt. Now, scurvy was a common occurrence on long voyages, and it's caused by not getting enough vitamin C. There were not many fruits and vegetables on these ships, which, you know, where you would get the bulk of your vitamin C as fruits and vegetables. They would rot quickly, and they had no means of preserving them. And if you developed scurvy, boy oh boy were you in for a bad trip. You would develop swollen legs that were extremely painful and your legs would also be covered with like red and blue spots. You would become weak and tired. Your skin would also bruise easily. Then, your breath, it would sour, and your gums would begin to bleed. After a time, your mouth would begin to swell up and start to rot, with all your teeth falling out. You'd start to feel like you were going crazy, and eventually you would die a slow and painful death. So yeah, uh, eat your vegetables. This part of the trip was called the scurvy belt because by this time, from, from leaving your port, of, your port home of Amsterdam, your fruits and vegetables would be gone by now. And so scurvy would begin to rear its ugly head. About 12 people died on the Batavia from it. And so, with nothing to do, that's when Geronimus began to espouse his views on the world, on law and order, on, on religion, on philosophy. And he was a very persuasive guy, with a silver tongue, that he used on everyone. See, Captain Arian, who already didn't like Francisco, he had another reason to hate him. At one point, they docked in South Africa to resupply, and Arian took a boat for, for an illicit trip with a lady friend without Francisco's permission. Then, later, while Francisco was on shore trading, Arian got drunk and assaulted a couple of the passengers. This led to Francisco berating him, and Arian left humiliated. It was shortly after this that Geronimus began to listen to Captain Arian's grievances against the commander of the ship. Arian, he was running his mouth off, you know, oh, I, oh, I'm so mad, I would do this and do that to him, you know, venting, venting. Geronimus, though, indulged his venting a lot. 
And so, as the ship was sailing away from South Africa and towards the East Indies, talk of mutiny began. The captain, Arian, and the undermerchant, Geronimus, plotted ways to take control of the ship. How long Geronimus was thinking this before he found a willing and upset ally? We don't know, um, though given his history, I would say it's, it was always on his mind. His background, his troubles at home, the friends and philosophies he spoke of had led to Geronimus wanting to be a god himself, to create his own kingdom on one of the islands in the East Indies where people would bow to him. They talked of how they would subdue the crew and kill those who stood against them. And all the fun they would have with Francisco Pelsart, who they would definitely have to kill. Now, now Geronimus, he didn't really give a shit about killing Francisco Pelsart, but he knew Arian hated him. So he went along with discussing these fantasies to make sure Arian would, would commit to the plot. He needed Arian as the captain. The plan was to break into Francisco's cabin and toss him overboard, then seize the weapons area and nail down the hatch, which led to the soldiers' cabin so they couldn't, you know, stop the mutiny. They would seize the ship and then go to a port, a, a Spanish port most likely, as Spain and the Dutch were at war, and so the, the company wouldn't be able to get them there. The boat it was full of riches, and so they could live like kings. Or they thought maybe we could turn to piracy, raiding the ships that were full of treasure in this part of the ocean. And so they began to mention this slowly to more and more people. All sailors under Captain Arian's command. It had to be done so, of course. Mutinies were, were risky business, and if discovered, there would be no mercy. They planned how to get to the weapons, how to sail with a smaller crew, where to go. And people were in. Life was rough. Uh, I know um, it, it's not exactly like it was a paradise awaiting for them in the East Indies. And combine that with Geronimus's powers of persuasion, they began to gather up a mutinous crew. And Captain Arian, he knew a key part of the mutiny would be to separate the ship, the Batavia, from the convoy it was in, so nobody would notice if they hijacked it. So. Off the coast of where Cape Town is today in South Africa, he subtly changed course and began drifting away from the convoy of ships. Now, back in these days, it was common for, for them to become separated, and so no one really suspected anything. P the plot was thinking, right? We need a lot of people if we're going to take the ship. And, and so they came up with a plan of how to get all the sailors on their side. Sailors made up about half the people on, on the ship. Oh, more than half uh, of the people on, on the ship were sailors. So, you know, you need a lot of them to be able to, to manage this right. And, and their plan of how they would get everybody on their side to mutiny, well, it was an interesting plan, folks. And what they needed to do was make the crew hate Francisco Pelsart. And they knew how to do just that. The plan to ignite the mutiny was this. Remember Lucretia Jan's doctor, right? The, the most, the beautiful passenger on board. She was, she was, you know, high social status. She was young, extremely beautiful. Well, it, it was an open secret on board the ship that Francisco, he had a big crush on her. He was, he was head over heels. Uh, with her, right? Now, now she, she was already married. She was kind of like letting him down gently. But he still, Francisco still had like big old wall parts in his eyes. So they planned to attack her. Get, get masked men to attack her. And this would provoke Francisco into lashing out in anger. They would wear masks, you know, to hide who attacked her. And so Francisco would just punish everybody. Communal punishment. Therefore, many others would, you know, feeling like they were being unfairly treated, join the mutiny. And so, on the evening of the 15th of May, a little over six months into the voyage, as Lucretia was leaving the great cabin after dinner, eight masked men grabbed her. They then dragged her to a quiet area at the back of the ship and smeared her face 
legs and genitals with a mixture of tar and shit. They, they covered her with it. Word of this attack spread quickly and Pelsart, Francisco Pelsart, was furious. But he didn't lash out. Now, Francisco was very ill at this time during the voyage, and not exactly sure what he was ill from. It was some kind of fever, perhaps a tropical fever. And so he was, he was weak and he was asleep for, for much of the time. So that kind of tempered his reaction to this. And also, he wouldn't react. Not against everyone, because Lucretia did happen to recognize one of the men. But he didn't act against him, neither. See, Francisco had a hint about what was happening. He felt that there was going to be some movement against them. He suspected it. He even suspected that Captain Arian may be involved. So, cooler heads prevailed. Francisco thought to himself, like, if I make a move against this, they're just going to rush me. I'll wait till I arrive in port where the authorities are. Then I'll act. But Arian and Geronimus, they, they didn't know this. And so they waited. They would strike again before they arrived in Batavia. This time, purely true violence. Then, less than a month later, before they could, due to Captain Arian drifting the ship off course for the mutiny, the ship hit rocks off the coast of Australia. The ship sank, and the survivors were now on tiny rocky islands with no food or fresh water. Arian and Francisco, they left to sail in a small boat to go to the East Indies to get help, and left Geronimus in charge of the 270-odd survivors. What followed was, quite simply, a bloodbath, an orgy of murder, mayhem, violence, and battles. And out of the 270 people who were initially shipwrecked on these islands, Less than a third of them would survive to tell the tale. But we will get into that in part two of The Mutiny on the Batavia. Crazy story, right? This should be like a HBO miniseries or something. But anyways, part two next week. That's where things get really, really crazy. So, so look forward to that one. And thank you, thank you so much for listening, everyone. And if you could please rate and review the podcast, that would help so, so much. New episodes every Monday and every Friday, so look forward to that. But until the next one, please look after each other and yourselves. Because I love you. Mike out. <laughs>